The convergence of globalization and technology has created a new brand of terrorism. There were persons who, for whatever reason, came to view their home country as the enemy. The kind of right-wing, religious-based domestic terrorism. Disturbing news tonight about homegrown terror. Part of this is big change in the White House and the cultural experience and some of the crazies are coming out of their closet. Right now, it looks like there is no connection between the men arrested and any known terrorist cell. Homegrown. Uh, yeah, homegrown, I should say. Now saying pro-lifers, people that believe in end-time prophecies, people that uh, are opposed to the administration's position on immigration, uh, those of us that are standing up for the sanctity of life and for the sanctity of marriage, all of those are now potential, and this is what they're saying, domestic terrorists. It's a terrorist next door that could be our bigger threat. They call people who believe in the sanctity of life, who believe in owning firearms, who believe in serving their country in the military and coming back, who are very concerned about the policies that this nation is embarking on, spending too much money, taxing too much. It's all listed right here. These are the domestic right-wing extremists. One million names under the watchful eye of the United States. America's so-called terrorist watch list has hit the net record number, according to one of the country's most prominent civil liberties groups. That's a lot of people to keep track of. They're adding new people all the time. It's a secret list that you don't know really quite how one gets on, and you don't know how you get off. In May 2007, President Bush signed a National Security Presidential Directive 51. The unclassified portion of NSPD 51 states that in the event of catastrophic emergency, a cooperative effort among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the federal government, coordinated by the president, will replace normal governmental procedure. Beginning in October, the Army plans to station an active unit inside the United States. The 3rd Infantry Division's 1st Brigade Combat Team has spent 35 of the last 60 months in Iraq. The Army unit may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control. Army Times reporting, quote, they may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control or to deal with potentially horrific scenarios, end quote. NORTHCOM, the Northern Command uh, that came into being in October of 2002, uh, when that came in, people uh, like me were concerned that the Pentagon was going to use its forces here in the United States, and now it looks like, in fact, it is, even though on its website it says it doesn't have units of its own. Now it's getting a unit of its own. H.R. 645, titled the National Emergency Centers Act, directs the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish national emergency centers throughout the United States. The bill directs these camps to be built in existing military installations, whether operational or not, for the stated purpose of providing temporary housing and to meet other appropriate needs as determined by the Secretary of Homeland Defense. Over the last decade, we've seen the introduction and enactment of some of the most dangerous legislation ever to be conceived by our elected officials, who have not forgotten who they serve, but only now reveal to the American people through the fruit of their own actions that our rights and our freedoms are secondary. The USA Patriot Act allows for American citizens to be picked up and incarcerated indefinitely without charges and allows law enforcement to conduct warrantless and secret searches of Americans' property and possessions. The Military Commissions Act dissolved the cornerstone of our Constitution by removing the writ of habeas corpus, allowing the permanent imprisonment of enemy combatants, and disallowing petitions to the court to know why you've been locked up in the first place. Although never passed by the Senate, the Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act shows us the mindset of our leaders in Washington. If passed into law, the bill would make public demonstrations and protesting into an act of terrorism and label the organizers as thought criminals and potential homegrown terrorists. Now that the federal government has the authority to sneak, snatch, and lock up its own citizens, a new bill has been introduced by Congress that gives the feds a place to hold those outspoken dissenters and potential domestic terrorists. The National Emergency Center's Establishment Act, or H.R. 645, allocates military bases to be converted into FEMA emergency centers. It also mandates that these camps be built complete with public works, medical, and educational facilities, just like the Japanese internment camps of the 1940s.
If we look at American history between 1942 and 1947, the data that was collected by the Census Bureau was handed over to the FBI and other organizations at the request of uh, President Roosevelt. And that's how the Japanese were rounded up and put into the internment camps. They're saying that if somebody who is connected with ACORN, now working for the U.S. Census, shows up at your door, knocks on it, and demands to know your race, your employment status, the name of everybody in your household, whether you've ever received food stamps, and your phone number, and everybody else's phone number, and you say, I'm not really comfortable giving that to you, you're going to get fined 5000 bucks. The United States government between 1942 and 1947 passed the Second War Powers Act. They used the U.S. Census information to round up the Japanese and put them in the internment camps. Right. Americans were told that they wouldn't have their information used against them. They did. The government doesn't build things that are not needed or that there aren't contingency plans that say there's a reason for them. Also, it's been reported by a World Net Daily that the Department of Homeland Security has already awarded nearly a $400 million contract to Halliburton to t build some temporary detention centers on an as-needed basis. History of government, not just American government, but the history of government well enough to know that most governments acquire power and they do not like dissent. We've, we are losing our freedoms in the United States. Uh, most Americans do not realize that we have free speech zones in the United States. I mean, talk about an oxymoron. You know, all of the 50 states are a free speech zone. You're an American. That, that by definition, creates a free speech zone. We have freedom of speech because we stand up and say what we think, not because the Founding Fathers ratified the First Amendment in 1791. So if we're losing the free speech zones, the governments in general throughout history have tried to quell dissent by controlling the media, which we already have in this country, and by generating fear of confrontation. Several things are, are, are occurring. One is that our system of justice is being changed. We're shifting from equal justice where every human being has certain unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, etc. to a system of social justice where no one has any such right, but where people are judged based upon the group that they're part of. Uh, once you label someone uh, in a derogatory manner, uh, an extremist, a potential militia member, terrorist, whatever term is used, uh, for some people the moniker will remain. Before you can persecute a people, before you can incarcerate large numbers of people, you have to marginalize them. Uh, you have to create the image uh, that these people are dangerous to society or they're extremists or radicals, call them what you will but marginalize them from the mainstream of society so that at that point uh, the rest of society will accept the persecution that might result upon this group. It's been an age-old strategy that's worked in every totalitarian regime in the history of the world and that's why we're concerned here in the United States when we see this kind of marginalization going on about people who voted for Ron Paul or people who voted for Chuck Baldwin. Uh, why are they being marginalized? Why uh, are they being singled out as a potential danger to society? And I think it's shades of the strategies and tactics of totalitarian regimes in history past, and that should never happen in this country. The people in Washington, D.C. haven't represented what was on the American people's minds for a long, long time. They are the most disassociated discombobulated, disconnected people on this planet. And they necessarily had to do that for all the violations of the Constitution that they've done. Just how far are you willing to go before you stand up and say no more to the federal government? Our founders actually intended for the federal government to be very small and limited and that most of the uh, service of government was to be done in the states. And so I think there's probably a growing conflict between states and the federal government. And I think there's some really good reason for the federal government to be concerned right now because I think there are a lot of people in the United States that are beginning to say, where are we going to draw the line in the sand and say no more to the federal government?